So, um, so this is a compass. I know it's a big reveal. You know, you're like, oh, I'm on a compass. Never seen one of those before. But the truth is, uh, a compass is an incredibly important tool when you are backpacking or out in the wilderness, you know, or anything like that. Uh, a compass uh, allows you to figure out where you are, you know, on a map, or it allows you to figure out from a map where you are in the world. It helps you helps you to read the map. And and the crazy thing is, you know, we've been using stuff like this for thousands of years to make our way around the world. It's, it's how we figure out where we are. It's how we figure out where we're going, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's really a pretty basic tool when you think about it. Now, the cool thing is that, that most of us now, you know, you, we carry around like a phone in our pocket that, that acts like a, a GPS, you know. It, it, even when I go backpacking, my phone lets me know where I am on the trail. Uh, my phone even lets me know what kind of elevation gain I'm having. It knows like if I'm almost at the top of the mountain, if it's almost time to like, you know, give up or it's like, no, no, you've only got a little bit more to go. Just keep going, just keep going. And, uh, and, I, and I love that feature. But one of the reasons why it's so important for anybody who does anything in the outdoors, particularly anything off map, off, you know, map, is the problem with all those cool gadgets is they all have batteries in them, right? Now, one of the most important uses for a compass is actually being able to figure out where north is. It's actually making sure that the position of north on the map, like in this case, for example, uh, north on the map, north is actually over here. And so I actually have to have my map oriented on this angle for me to be able to understand what's in front of me, right? Because if I don't have my map oriented the right way, then I, I can't read what's around me properly. Like, like for example, uh, when I moved to Thunder Bay, I had this compass in my van at the time that was kind of up here, like a little heads up display, and it would tell you northeast, southwest, nothing fancy. And one of the things that was kind of crazy is that I started to think that my compass was broken in the, in the van because I knew, I knew it would say that I was heading north when I knew that I was heading west. And, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with the stupid compass in the van. And then I looked at a map of Thunder Bay, and Thunder Bay is a really long, skinny city. And I thought that the long, skinny part of the city ran north to south, but when I looked at a map, it, I found out that it actually ran more like east to west. You see, orientation is everything. Now, we've been talking about the fruit of the spirit now for a while. And I want to uh, remind ourselves about what we're talking about today. So we're going to repeat this verse uh, as many times as it takes for all of us to get the fruit of the Spirit memorized. Now, Galatians 5, 22, 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, so far, we've looked at love, joy, peace, patience and kindness. Now, if you've missed those, you can catch up uh, on the voxalliance.ca website. Uh, we have the sermons posted there. They're on Facebook as well. And we have a YouTube channel. If you want to just go on YouTube and you just search Vox Alliance, our channel comes up and we put the recordings from the service up there. And we also put the messages up there as well. And you can watch on your TV uh, at home if you want. Now, today, Today we're going to be looking at goodness. Now, goodness is one of those words that's kind of tricky to define. It's one of those words that that has um, is one of those words that has a lot of different meanings, and, and 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 because it has a lot of different meanings, it, it ends up meaning that it has really vague meanings. You know what I mean? Like you use it so many different ways that it kind of gets watered down almost. Like. For example, in Webster's, Webster's defines, uh, it has stuff like this written for goodness. Uh, conforming to the moral order of the universe. Moral order? Like, what does that even mean? Uh, that in itself is hard to define. Or, or it says the advancement of prosperity or well-being. I, I guess like, like uh, I, I feel good, you know? 
or, or it has a product or a commodity to be sold. That's definitely not what we're looking for. It even has good as like a proof of wrongdoing, right? Like as in like they didn't have the goods on them so they couldn't charge them. And, and the Bible commentaries and dictionaries aren't a whole lot better. Uh, like one of them, Strong's Lexicon, has the definition of the Greek word that's translated in Galatians as goodness, um, agathos, agathosune. Uh, it has it as uprightness of heart and life, goodness or kindness. I, I love when the word that you're trying to define is actually used in the definition of that word. That's, that's super helpful. I really like that. It, it seems like one of those words that we all use all of the time, but we aren't and we think we know the definition, but like as soon as you start trying to be a little bit more specific about it, you realize that you, you haven't quite got the definition down right. It becomes even foggier. I mean, think about it. We, we tell ourselves to be good. We tell our children to be good, you know, but we don't even know necessarily <clears throat> what that means. <coughs> I got thinking about the, the compass and the map again. Now, if I don't have my map orientated correctly, if I don't have my map oriented correctly, if I don't have the map pointing north and to the compass, see right here, by the way, it, in my backyard, north is kind of about that way. And, and so if my map's like this, I actually kind of have to change my map a little bit. I gotta move my map a little bit so that my map actually points the way I want it to. So it's gotta be kind of like, kind of like that. Now my map will be pointing correctly, right? And I got thinking about how we wanna make sure that north is pointing the right direction in real life as well, right? And I was thinking about how the fruit of the spirit, in a sense, they're kind of like reorientate, reorienting our lives so that our lives are pointing true north. And with this fruit that we're talking about this week, it's like our lives need to get oriented towards goodness as opposed to oriented towards sin or, or evil or, or brokenness like the Bible talks about. Now, Christianity has focused on verses that talk about that for a long time. Verses like Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? It's this idea, we're so focused on this idea that we are all born sinful and evil and desperately wicked. The, the Bible, in a sense, is teaching that we are, we are born with this orientation towards brokenness, that, that our north, that our north points towards brokenness, points towards evil. And there are quite a few passages that talk about these kinds of things or say these kinds of things. But what I got thinking about is that it's much more complicated than that. And, and that if, if, if we only think about it in those terms, that, that aggressively, we maybe are missing something. So this past week, I was listening, this past week, I was listening to uh, the band Pomplamous. Now, if you're ever interested and you really like kind of chill but funky music, they do covers, their own stuff, band called Pomplamous. But they have this really cute song, and it's this love song, uh, and it's got really cool, uh, cute lyrics. Like it says, if you think you're garbage, then I guess I'm a seagull. Anyways, but the song has this one line in it, and I was driving around, and I was listening to the song, and it, it struck me. And, and the line is this. It says, I used to think people were good. Now I just think they're people. And it, and it struck me because I, I, I got thinking about how myself and how a lot of us is, uh, followers of Jesus sometimes think about about how people are oriented and I got thinking about like if I was to sing that song it, it wouldn't be I think people are good I used to think people are good it would be I used to think people were evil now I just think they're people and here's what I mean by this before you start yelling at me about you know total depravity or, or, or original sin or any of these theological concepts what I mean by it is this, when we think about it in terms of like this, this like one or the other kind of thinking, this either or, right? Like you're either born good or you're born evil. We lose, I think, one nuance. We lose some of the practical reality of it. Uh, but So I think there's a, a better way to think about it. See, I think that each of us, according to the scriptures, each of us bears the image of God 
And each of us is born with this orientation towards brokenness. And both of those exist at war within us. Like, in, in a sense, every one of us has the potential for incredible good or, or incredible evil. And I guess for me, it's trying to figure out what does that mean? How do we, how do we think that through? And how does that play out in everything? It's, it's a little bit like in Romans chapter 7, where Paul famously talks about this, this war that's going on within himself. He talks about how there are these things that he wants to do. He wants to do them. Is it the way that he wants to live? And he doesn't, he doesn't do it. But then he talks about how there's these other things within him. And he says, I don't want to do these things. I don't want to live this way. But he finds himself doing them anyways. It's as if he can't stop. There's this war between these two parts of his, his personality, his two natures that are at war within him. He's talking about these competing orientations that exist within each of us, this orientation towards God and the way God created us to live, and this orientation towards this brokenness, this sin, this evil that, that seems to sometimes have, you know, a hold of us. And it's what the Bible talks about as kind of the flesh and the spirit, these two different ways uh, of, of, of thinking about how we're going to behave, these two different orientations. And, and I got thinking about how uh, the fruit of the Spirit is about reorientation. It's about changing. It's about adjusting how we're orientated. And, and, and instead of being orientated towards giving in to this brokenness, giving in to this desire to do things that are self-destructive, we become instead orientated towards doing things that are actually good. We, we begin to respond the way that Jesus would have us respond. We, we we start to give in to that part of ourselves that wants to live the way that Jesus has taught us and showed us and died and rose again to make possible. We start to, we start to be oriented towards this better part of ourselves. This idea of giving in to this leading and this prompting of this mysterious Holy Spirit that the Bible talks about. And in particular, this idea of goodness is, is almost more foundationally that it becomes the way our lives are oriented. And, and I got thinking about it, I got thinking about it a little bit like this verse in Matthew chapter 6. It's verse 22 and 23, and it says this. It says, the lamp of the body is the eye, and Jesus is talking, and he says, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. This is a pretty weird verse. And, and, and scholars have had a hard time with it over the years because modern translations don't like this idea of like the good eye and the bad eye or the good eye and the evil eye because it just seems kind of weird. And so they start trying to figure out other ways. So they talk about having like healthy eyes and, and unhealthy eyes because all this evil eye talk's a bit weird. Now, my mom... My mom could give an amazing evil eye. Like when I was a kid, I grew up in a, in a small church and my dad was the pastor of that church. And if me and my brothers and sisters were, were misbehaving during church, my mom could put a stop to that kind of behavior. If we were screwing around, my mom would stop us <coughs> with nothing but her evil eye. Like my mom could give us this look that silently told us that if we did not stop immediately, the beating was coming. And just with her eyes, just with the evil eye, silently she could let us know. But the problem with the evil eye is that we either think of it like that, like mom giving us the evil eye, or, or it gets tied to all these weird superstitious things. You got to remember that the, the King James Bible this was the first one to translate evil eye it was written just a little while after all that witch-burning kind of hysteria was going on. And so evil eye was kind of this weird phrase, and they, and, and they didn't like it. So what does it mean? What are we talking about here when we read this passage? And what does that have to do with the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of goodness? Right? Well, it all goes back to the languages that were spoken at the time of Jesus. Jesus is most likely speaking to a crowd of Jewish people in a version of Hebrew. Now, all of the translations that we have are all recorded in either Aramaic or Greek because those were the languages of the day. They were common. 
But realistically, Jesus was probably talking to, to uh, the Israelite listeners in Hebrew. And in Hebrew, the idiom good eye actually means like a generous eye. So if a person had a good eye, that person was a generous person. And if that person had an evil eye, that person was a selfish and stingy person, right? Good eye, you were quick to offer what you had to others. Evil eye, and, and you were stingy with what you had. Good eye, and this is where it come, the generosity comes in, if you had a good eye, you saw other people's needs quickly. And if you had an evil eye, all you could see was your own problems and your own needs. And this makes sense. It makes sense to see it this way because before this passage, uh, Jesus is talking about not storing up treasure on earth, but storing up treasure in heaven. And then after this passage, he talks about how you can't serve God and money. And so it makes sense that it has to do with generosity and it has to do with money and all of that kind of flows together. And here's, here's kind of what I got thinking about. What's happening in a bunch of different places in the scripture, including that word agathosune that's translated as goodness in Galatians chapter 5, is that word is also sometimes used for generosity. And so there's this idea of goodness and generosity become tied together quite often in the scriptures. And I, and I got thinking about how that works. Now first, the fruit of the spirit of goodness should lead us to be good to people, to, to do good to people with our resources, with our time, with our energy and our physical help, and with our material possessions and resources, right? So if you are, if uh, the more our lives become oriented towards goodness, the more also our spirit and our heart becomes generous with the things that we have to help others with, to be good to others with. And, and, and so there's this idea of generosity, right? There's this idea of, of being good to others and this idea of being willing to share with others because there's something incredibly powerful about this. And I think we as followers of Jesus have lost this. And this is why this, is why this, this deeper character of goodness and generosity are so important to keep together. Because for so many followers of Jesus, for so many Christians, if I give to the poor, if I give a couple bucks to the poor, then I'm sort of done. Except that and that's like a good thing to do if I give a couple bucks to the poor here, if I donate to the church, if I maybe support missions overseas, then I'm getting some bonus points with God. And we're missing out on how deeply powerful generosity can truly be. And I wanted to kind of give an example of this. I want to look at a passage in the book of Acts that talks about the early church and how the early church was oriented towards goodness and towards generosity. And because of that, they had this powerful uh, an incredible impact on the world around them. In Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 32, this is what it says. It says, The community of believers, so the people who called themselves followers of Jesus, was one in heart and mind. None of them would say, This is mine, about any of their possessions, but held everything in common. The apostles continued to bear powerful witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and an abundance of grace was at work among them all. There were no needy persons among them. Those who owned properties or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds from the sale and place them in the care and under the authority of the apostles. And then it was distributed to anyone who was in need. It is interesting to me. One, isn't that incredible? Like, like that level of generosity and goodness, those were people whose entire lives had shifted around and were now oriented towards Jesus. They were oriented towards love and joy and peace and patience. But this idea of goodness became not just something they were trying to do, but it became this defining characteristic of who they were. And then that translated into their generosity. Right? And so they held everything in common. Nobody would say, this is mine. But what's really cool is Paul, Paul says this. You, you remember the line where he says that this group was bearing powerful witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. This generosity was screaming the message and life of Jesus with the world around them. 
It was screaming the power of this risen Jesus, the power of this good news, this gospel that they wanted to share. This was a powerful, powerful message. I mean, think about, think about what that would do in our world today. How they saw their meager possessions was in such stark contrast to the society and the world around them that was grasping all of the time, just trying to get their own needs met and to make sure that they had enough. Got to look out for number one first. That hoarding mentality that is at the heart of capitalism, right? Jesus' followers had this entirely different mentality. Their whole orientation was towards generosity, was towards goodness, and that generosity spoke loudly to the world around them. It spoke loudly of a new way of living life, of a new way of being, of a new way of seeing, of a new kingdom. And I am pretty sure that the same would be true today. Can you imagine if you and I as followers of Jesus lived that way? Can you imagine what it would do? Can you imagine how people would see it? People would uh, uh, grasp that, 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 that the things that, you, that were yours, you didn't see as yours. You saw them as, as everyone's to be used as necessary. Could you imagine what living that kind of generosity would say to the world around us? But then it goes further than that. So it's not just generosity uh, in, in, when it's respect to our, our material possessions. But I think goodness and generosity are tied together, uh, just like we talked about kindness last week. Because now it becomes this idea of how we approach goodness. And so that good eye is not just looking for opportunities to meet somebody's need, but that good eye is looking for opportunities to do good to the world around us. Maybe it isn't giving. Maybe it's just being good in, in our world. Maybe it's, maybe it's the power of, of, you know, when you realize that you left the store without paying, going back to pay for something. Right? Maybe it's those kinds of things. Like, are your eyes looking for opportunities for goodness in the world? Is, is, is that the orientation that you find your life has? Like, do you and I have good eyes or, or evil eyes? Are we looking for opportunities for generosity? Are, are, are we looking, are we generous with how we show goodness? It's like last week we talked about this with kindness, that we, we could be generous with our kindness and we could, we could give it out liberally. The same is true for goodness. Are you and I, are we being generous when it comes to the goodness that we show to the world around us? But then I, I got thinking about orientation and I got thinking about orientation and I got thinking about the fruit of the Spirit. There are different ways to approach the fruit of the Spirit. For some people, this list, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, sometimes this list becomes um, just another way to feel really badly about how shitty we are at following Jesus. It's like, I, I'm not loving enough, I'm not joyful enough, I'm not peaceful. Do you know what I mean? Like it becomes like, oh, I got to try harder, I got to try harder. Oh, I failed again today, I failed again today. Like you get home at the end of the day and you go over that checklist and you're like, no, no, oh, mate, no, yelled at the guy in the car, no. You know what I mean? But that's not how fruit works. Fruit doesn't just suddenly appear, right? I, I love the metaphor of fruit because fruit is something that grows. It starts as a seed that's planted and the seed germinates and the seed begins to grow and eventually you get some kind of tree or plant and then eventually that thing, you start to get buds and then you start to get some small fruit and then eventually the fruit grows to the point that it is ripe and it's ready for eating. It's a process. It's a journey. It's not something that happens overnight and, I, and that's why I love this idea of orientation. This idea that, that I'm not there yet. But I have, I have turned. One of the things you do when you have a compass, they, they often say, is you take the compass and you hold the compass. And, and people kind of do this sometimes where they just turn the compass. And they say, no, the, the, the important thing is to hold the compass out and to turn your body until you get the compass lined up with north. So that my whole body is lined up. And then I can start to sight some points. And then I know where I'm going to start walking if I want to head the direction that I want to head. And there's incredible power in that. And I think that there's something to be said for this idea of the fruit of the Spirit and thinking about it like this idea of orientation. It, am, I, am I oriented towards goodness? Am I oriented towards love, towards joy? 
I, I might not be there yet. I might not be this perfectly loving being. I might not be this perfectly joyful being. But am I oriented towards love or am I oriented the other way? Am I growing that way? Is the journey headed predominantly in that direction? And that's the question that I think I want to keep asking ourselves here. Because this is what the Holy Spirit wants to do. This is what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. It's calling us. The Holy Spirit is calling us home because love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, those are the characteristics of our home. Those are the characteristics of what we were created for. And the Holy Spirit is whispering to us, calling us towards those things to fill our lives with them. And the Holy Spirit wants to complete that work in us. Paul says this in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul says, I'm sure about this, which I love. The one who started a good work in you will stay with you to complete the job by the day of Christ Jesus. There's something powerful about realizing that this is all not just something we're trying to do on our own. This is something we just try harder. Oh, now I'm going to be, now I'm going to be able to do it. That's, that's not what this is about. That's why I la like the language of orientation. It's why when it comes to, the Bible talks about being baptized by the Spirit, or sometimes we say filled with the Spirit. And I like the term surrender because it, it's like, it's like the Holy Spirit is trying to whisper to us and call us home. And I'm going to give in to that. I want to give in to that more often than I give in to these other things that are whispering in my ears. I want to give in to love more than I give in to hate. I want to give in to joy more than I give in to bitterness. You start to, you start to understand kind of what I'm getting at. And as this fruit of the Spirit grows in us, and as we learn to surrender to the Holy Spirit more often, that war that's existing within us that we talked about, those, those two natures, those two orientations, that war, gets, it gets easier and easier to give in to the Holy Spirit than to give in to that brokenness that's inside of us. It gets easier to respond to anger and to violence with peace and with love. It gets, it gets easier to respond to materialism with generosity. It gets easier for us to respond to aggression with patience and, and to brokenness with compassion and love. Because as our lives become oriented towards our home, towards the kingdom of God, towards God himself, towards this life Jesus taught us, towards these fruit that grow and begin to blossom within us, the easier it is for us to live out that life that Jesus called us to, and the easier it is for us to then invite others to join us on that journey as well, and to share the message and life of Jesus with others. That's, that's what it means to share the gospel, it's to say, look, there's, you don't have to keep living this way. You don't have to keep your life oriented towards all of these destructive things anymore. You don't have to do that. There's, a, there's another way to orient our lives. There's another way to live. There's another way to be. And it's not about beating ourselves up because we aren't holy enough yet. And it's not about beating ourselves up because we haven't achieved all the check boxes yet. Because the life that Jesus called us to is not always an easy life, but it's a good one. And so I guess my blessing for you this week is the words of the psalmist in Psalm 34, 8. The psalmist says, taste and see how good the Lord is. May you continue to orient your life towards the way that Jesus called us and taught us and died and rose again to make possible. May you continue to see the fruit of the Spirit grow and blossom in your life. God bless. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining me.